Okay. Hello. Um, so first of all, I should say, I'm really sorry. I don't have the first midterm back yet. Um, it's just been a ton of like emergency things piling up one after another, getting in the way of finishing it. I, I hope I'll have it done in the next few days. Um, and on that topic, I should also mention that the second midterm is due, uh, when is it due? Um, oh, this coming Monday already, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, it's pretty similar instructions and everything to the first midterm. Uh, I don't know if there's anything extra to say about it, unless you guys have questions. Um, okay. I know obviously it's uh, not ideal that you have to start working on the second midterm before I got the first one back because that's where I am. All right. Um, uh, on that note, I want to talk about the transcendental dialectic. So, um, Right, so I mean, we're always on the doctrine of elements. I don't usually like that. Maybe I'll have a different thing. Right, which has two parts. And at least one way of understanding what the elements are here is that the elements are sensibility and understanding, or aesthetic and logic. Anyway, those are the two parts of the transcendental doctrine of elements. Um, the aesthetic and the logic, and the transcendental logic has two parts the transcendental analytic, which we've now finished. And now it's divided into the analytic of concepts and the analytic of principles. And then now we move on to the second part here. That is the second part of the transcendental logic. Transcendental dialectic. And the transcendental dialectic also has two parts. This maybe is a little bit surprising, actually. Two parts are the concept of pure reason. And the dialectical sequences of pure reason. I mean, so the reason I say this is a little bit surprising is that I don't remember if I got a chance to talk about this, probably not. But at the beginning of the transcendental logic and or at the beginning of the analytic, I forget exactly where, which introductory section this is in, but he says that, uh, so uh, that formal logic, general logic is about concepts, judgments and syllogisms or inferences, right? So, um, um, he says that on the other hand, in the case of transcendental logic, the analytic is gonna contain a part about concepts and a part about judgments, in particular the principles, right? But like transcendental, Something of the faculty of judgment is one of it's like an alternate title for the analytical principles. And this is about judgments, or at least about judgments. Anyway, um, but then he says, but there won't be a part about syllogisms or that is uh, inferences, conclusions. I'm going to talk more about what a syllogism is later. But he says there won't be a part of the transcendental analytic about that because um, the like. Um, syllogisms of pure reason are all dialectical, something like that. 
So what you kind of expect that then that this would have two parts and this would have one part, right? This is concepts, judgments, and then this one would be syllogisms. But instead, it also begins with the part about concepts. Um, and I don't know exactly what to say about that, uh, but I wanted to point it out before we go on. All right, so anyway, um, we put the same reading with the, the introduction to the transcendental dialectic and the beginning of this section on the concept of pure reason. <laughs> um, now, um, we think we understand why this section called it. Actually, you know, what I'm about to say is connected to this reason. But anyway, I'll just say it. So, like, we think we understand why uh, this part is here. Um, the transcendental analytic uh, has uh, shown what makes synthetic a priori judgments of the understanding possible, right? I added under, of the understanding because remember, math, there's mathematical synthetic a priori judgments, which are based on the form of sensibility, and those are supposed to be dealt with in the aesthetic. Here we're talking about, um, in the transcendent analytic, we're talking about um, uh, synthetic a priori judgments that are based on the form of the understanding specifically. That is metaphysics, basically, as opposed to mathematics, right? Um, so, but in the process of showing what it is that makes synthetic a priori judgments possible, we've uh, also showed the limits within which uh, uh, that kind of synthetic a priori principle can possibly apply. Um, Because um, um, because the the um, fundamental like way we know the, the, uh, the justification for these synthetic a priori judgments is that we showed that the understanding, I mean, sorry, that the imagination. Um, must be able to to synthesize what is manifold in sense, that is in space and time, um, as an image of empirical concepts, at least one empirical concept. So you know, so that was that's the basis of all our knowledge of these synthetic a priori principles. So they're um, we know they're true because they have to be true to make that possible, that is, to make the application of empirical concepts possible. Or as Kant often says, to make experience possible, right? But experience just is the application of concepts to empirical intuition. Resulting in the, the cognition or knowledge of empirical objects. Right, so um, that's the justification for them, and therefore, uh, obviously, they only um, hold for possible objects of experience. Right, like nothing we've said about that has like given any justification for extending these principles uh, to things that could never become objects of experience. So now, um, um, what's left for the transcendental dialectic is to try to explain why, um, nevertheless, we have this feeling that we should be able to extend these principles further. I mean, that's what we expect to come here, basically. Um, but, um, but then a bunch of surprising things happen. 
So, I mean, I guess like the most surprising thing is just the fact that suddenly we're talking about this faculty called reason. Um, I mean, we haven't heard very much about reason at all before this in the book, at least not since the preface. Of course, it's in the title of the book, <laughs> Critique of Pure Reason, right? But um, up until now, uh, um, we haven't really heard anything about what this faculty is for, what it does. Um, but now suddenly we find out in the dialectic that the error we're going to be talking about here is seems like it's not an error of the understanding, right? Like, in fact, the error of the understanding was what we talked about before in the um, in the amphiboly or in the in phenomena and noumena. Um, now we're going to be talking about an error of reason, and reason has its own concepts, which that's why I said it's connected to the weirdness about this. All of a sudden, we find out it's not about extending the categories beyond the bounds of experience. It's these other concepts of pure reason. Um, right, and in fact, Kant says, um, so this is on B352, it's page 299 at Kemp Smith. Um, Maybe I should start at the bottom of 298. We should untitle the principles whose application is confined entirely within the limits of possible experience imminent. And those on the other hand, which profess to pass beyond those these limits transcendent. In the case of these latter, I am re not referring to the transcendental employment or misemployment of the categories, which is merely an error of the faculty of judgment when it is not duly curbed by criticism. Skipping a little bit, I mean actual principles which incite us to tear down all those boundary fences and to seize possession of an entirely new domain which recognizes no limits of demarcation. Right, so the like transcendental employment of the categories. Um, that remember that was that was what he kept saying in phenomena and humana and in the amphiboly that um, the the mistake here is. And notice that the categories have a transcendental meaning or transcendental sense. That is, um, there's, there's nothing intrinsically about them that's limited to the objects of our form of sensibility. They're just predicates of objects in general. But then to, to conclude from that, that they also have a transcendental employment, that we can actually use them to refer to more objects than to be the objects of our form of sensibility. So um, here he's saying, um, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something um, that, um, and so that appears to be like, that is basically Leibniz's mistake. It's discussed in Phenomena and Numina, and especially in the appendix to Phenomena and Numina. Why is this mistake is this transcendental employment of the categories, where we try to use the categories to uh, refer to objects in general, not realizing that they can only be used for the objects of sensibility. But now he says, I'm gonna be talking about something else, some kind of principles that make us, um, uh, that specifically make us try to think things that could never be the objects of sensibility. Um, so that's kind of puzzling. However, I want to say right away that it's not as bad as um, I made it seem. So, like, um, Actually, so first of all, right before the passage I just read, 
So this is still on B352, but it's on page 298 in Kemp Smith. In defiance of all the warnings of criticism, it, that is transcendental illusion, it carries us all together beyond the empirical employment of categories and puts us off with a merely deceptive extension of pure understanding. So like this mistake, in some sense is a mistake of reason, but it's kind of like somehow under the influence of reason, it's the understanding that's going to be misinformed. The pure understanding. Um, and that's kind of necessary because as he employed um, as he implied on the previous page so this is B3 well it's two pages packed in, in the B edition but it's page uh, 297 in Kemp Smith B350 Truth and error, therefore, and consequently also illusion as leading to error, are only to be found in the judgment, that is, only in the relation of the object to our understanding. So really, under, understanding is the only faculty, or at least, right, these are the three higher faculties in this concept, right? or the three intellectual faculties in a broad sense of intellectual. Why in a broad sense? Because in a narrow sense of intellectual, remember intellect and understanding are basically the same thing, right? So, but in a broad sense of intellectual, these are the three intellectual faculties. So, um, so like error is actually made by the faculty of judgment because the faculty of judgment is the faculty of applying rules to cases. And you make an error by applying a rule to the wrong case. Um, but the rule is uh, an act of the understanding, constant. Right? So the mistake that judgment makes is always misusing a concept of the understanding. And I mean, uh, that's absolutely general, right? Like this is the only way, you know, because a mistake means like asserting something false, it means like uh, um, uh, inherently means misapplying a rule to a case. Asserting correspondence between a rule and the object where there isn't correspondence. So, um, so whatever the rule of role of reason in this illusion is, the ultimate error is going to be made by judgment applying concepts of the understanding incorrectly, and that also means that we talk about concepts of pure reason that. Um, uh, they're concepts that are like due to pure reason, that are required by virtue of pure reason or whatever. But insofar as they're concepts, they're they're concepts of the understanding because that's what concepts are, right? They're like acts of the understanding. So um So, I mean, the, the like new entrance of reason here doesn't really, it's still true what we expected that, you know, this is going to be about the proper employment of the understanding, and this is going to be about the attempt to employ the understanding in some wrong way. This is also about the attempt to employ the understanding in some other wrong way. What, what is the difference? I mean, aside from like the details of what the error is, Apparently, the difference is that I mean, even though he uses the word illusion when he's talking in phenomena and noumena too, but apparently the difference is that this is a real natural illusion, whereas this is a, a mistake. So this, whatever it is, can be corrected, right? That is, it's it's not natural and um, unavoidable. 
So like Leibniz made this mistake, but if you show where the mistake is, we don't have an overwhelming tendency to still believe Leibniz is right. Um, whereas in this case, it's supposed to be, he compares it to an optical illusion, right? That just understanding the source of the illusion doesn't make it go away because it's a natural illusion. So, you know, you can know perfectly well and he says you could be an astronomer, right? So you can know perfectly well that the moon is the same apparent size when it's on the horizon as it is when it's overhead, meaning like it's, you know, takes up the same angle <laughs> when it's on the horizon as it does when it's overhead. And yet it looks bigger. <laughs> and even if you're an astronomer, it's still going to look bigger. Actually, I think the reason for that illusion is still not well understood. At least it wasn't last I checked, but maybe now they understand it. I don't know. Um, but um, so, you know, therefore, actually, when you look into the structure of the dialectical inferences of pure reason in detail, you'll see that the categories do come back. So, right, like the overall uh, structure of the transcendental dialectic is going to be that there are three ideas of reason. I mean, the ideas are um, the idea of the soul, the idea of the world, and the idea of that is of the world as a whole. This is the idea of the soul as something. Um, uh, immaterial, basically. The rational soul. This is the idea of the world as a totality, a whole. And this is the idea of God. So these are the three ideas. But then, at least under the first two, it's going to be very clear that the old four part table comes back. Quality, quality, relation, and modality. Um, right, so the part that's about rational cosmology is actually divided into four parts. There are four antinomies corresponding to these four headings. The part about the soul is about the paralysis of the pure reason is. Um, um, in the A edition, it actually also was explicitly divided into four parts. One of the things he did when moving to the B edition, and I think it was just to make room for a longer version of the transcendental analytic, is that he cut down the paralogism. The paralogism is like he summarized it, condensed it. And so in the B edition, there, it isn't explicitly divided into four parts, but you'll see in it, there's still a, like a four part table arranged according to the categories. In the part about rational theology or transcendental theology, which is called the ideal of pure reason, it is hard to trace where the categories come in, although we mentioned some of them at various points. Um, and uh, I'm not sure where that, why that is. Maybe I'll have something to say about it when we get to that section. Um, um, but I think uh, overall the moral is that, um, again, the way this error is going to work, the way this illusion is going to work, is that reason somehow demands that we be able to think certain objects the rational soul, the world as a whole, and God. But um, we don't have any uh, concepts for thinking objects in general. So, I mean, right, we can't use empirical or mathematical concepts to think these things because they're not possible objects of sense. So the only concepts we have that we could possibly use to, to represent them as objects are the categories. And so when reason demands that we think these objects, the 
or I mean, not just think, but that we cognize these objects, that we refer to them somehow. Uh, it's going to turn to the understanding and say, okay, you know, show me how I can cognize these things, and all the understanding can supply is the categories. So in the end, the result is going to be is going to be pretty much what we expect, namely, only in organized in this new way. But it's going to be that the categories are going to be we're going to try to apply the categories to things that could never possibly be objects of sensibility. Um, now, I mean, you you may notice based on the way I just wrote this up here that it seems like these three ideas may correspond to the three moments in the table of categories. And I actually, I think that's right. Um, but I won't say more about that right now. Um, well, except I will say this, in some sense it has to be right because as we'll see, Kant connects these to the three different types of syllogism. And he connects the three different types of syllogism to the three relations of judgment, that is categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. So like, for sure, these are somehow related to categorical, hypothetical, disjunctive, and that, at least in the case of relation, the illusion of those three moments. So, I mean, apparently what I've been talking about is also somehow what he's getting at when he talks about um, how illusion always, rep always results from two faculties like interfering with each other. Um, that, um, Right, because he says, uh, where is this? Yeah, 298, this is all around the same place. Um, Actually, 297, that is B350. No natural force can of itself deviate from its own laws. Thus, neither the understanding by itself, uninfluenced by another cause, nor the senses by themselves would fall into error. Skipping a little bit. Now, since we have no sorts of knowledge besides these two, it follows that error is brought about solely by the unobserved influence of sensibility, unobserved or unnoticed might be a better translation here, influence of sensibility on the understanding. And then he compares it to like the way um, uh, body can be drawn off its course by uh, by a force that doesn't act along the direction it's moving in. Um, well, but it's not exactly the way we think about the situation. I think he's thinking of the motion, the momentum of the body as itself a kind of moving force. And then saying that we have this other force to it, so to speak. Um, that's not exactly the way we think about it, but it does basically get the right result, you know, like that. Um, that the direction the body is going to tend to move is this way instead of this particular way, drawn off by this force. Um, so, like, he's saying that. I mean, I don't know, actually, it depends how you look at it. Or it's, uh, that's kind of the way he describes it. But then on the other hand, when he talks about the two faculties interfering with each other, it's more like.
Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how to give how to draw the correct course into that version of it. So never mind. <laughs> but the main point is that like um, somehow illusion results from the understanding being pushed off course by some other faculty. Now, I mean, he says there explicitly in the part I just read that the other faculty is always sensibility. Right, he says that all illusion results from the uh, unobserved influence of sensibility on the understanding. So, uh, What's not clear is um, possibly he means all sense illusion, like optical illusion, results from that, where transcendental illusion results from the influence of reason on that understanding. Um, or possibly somehow here also sensibility is, is responsible. It would be a better reading of the text to make that come out. That somehow sensibility is responsible here too, but I just I don't know how to argue that. Um, he, you know, but um, what's clear is that whether it's sensibility or reason, the way it like to make it less uh, metaphorical, I guess. Although, I mean. Is it a metaphor? So, like, remember that one of the things we showed in the Amphiboly is the whole idea of different realities harshly canceling each other out. Like, being opposed directions is something we can only make sense of in terms of literal direction in space. So, that suggests. And again, you might you can see why Kant might want not, not want to say this outright, but that suggests that the fact that our faculties can can interfere with each other must ultimately be due to actual forces acting in different directions, like inside our brain, because otherwise we can't understand how faculties can interfere with. Each other. Like it's the opposition of directions in space that it provides, so to speak, the schema for the for the concepts of agreement and opposition. Um, well, but anyway, I mean, like metaphorical or not, how um, how exactly does this knocking off course work? And Kant says, in the case of optical illusion, he says that. Um, it's because the, um, we mistake uh, some subjective parts of our perception for objective. Um, like, uh, and that causes us to judge wrongly. So, That is basically like for some reason, uh, um, things. Well, I guess like there's a stick bent in water. Now, is this an illusion exactly or not? I don't know. I mean, it's not. A, it's not really like. It's not like the two lines of illusion where one looks longer, even though the other isn't. Um, it's um, I mean, because here what what it looks like is happening is like geometrically impossible. You know, I, I, like as you can tell, if you draw a line this way, you know, like it can't both be that these are right angles and that one is shorter than the other. Whereas here it's just. Um, Looks different than it is, but it could be. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Anyway, so, but you know, the stick that looks bent because it's stuck in water. I don't know if I sent it the right way. So, uh, so like, the point is here that um, 
uh, the, the light that's coming into my eyes from the stick really is um, like, in other words, if you look at the picture on my retina, you would really see the bend. It's really there in the light that's coming into my eye. So, like, the mistake is that I attribute that bend to the object. Whereas it really is something in the, like, in, like my perspective on the object, or the way I'm receiving impressions from the object. Which, if I correctly classified it that way, I could come to the correct judgment about what the object is. What the shape of the object is. Um, is that empirical? Illusion? Yeah, yeah. empirical in a sense. Yeah, optical illusion, sense illusion. Actually, the example Cock gives is e even simpler, right? He says, like, the way the ocean on the horizon looks higher than the ocean near the shore. I don't even know if that's true, but it really looks higher. Maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. But he says, uh, um, the, the ocean on the horizon looks higher than the ocean than the, than the ocean on the shore, and the reason is because the you know rays from the ocean on the horizon strike our eye at a higher place. So again, that's something about the relationship between me and the object, but instead I'm taking it to be something about the object itself. I'm thinking of the object as having, you know, like having parts that are higher than each other. Um, again, like, I mean, it's not so easy to see how to explain an illusion like this. I don't know when illusions, when the first illusion like this was discovered or whether it's not new about illusions like this. That's a good question. Um, but in any case, uh, it's a little harder to explain an illusion like that on those principles, right? Because if you looked at the image on my retina, I still wouldn't see that one of these is longer than the other, right? It's something that happens between that image and my judgment or whatever <laughs> that makes it look like one is longer. Anyway, um, uh, Kant itself says, he's not going to get into the details of explaining optical illusions here. The main point is to, to like develop the analogy here, where um, he says, um, this is uh, B353 on Kemp Smith, page 299. The cause of this, that is the cause of the transcendental illusion, is that there are fundamental rules and maxims for the employment of our reason, subjectively regarded as a faculty of human knowledge, and that these have all the appearance of being objective principles, right? So it's, it's the same as an optical illusion in the sense that we're taking something that is subjective and uh, projecting it, so to speak, onto the object. But in this case, what's subjective is um, certain maxims and principles. So, like roughly speaking, the diagnosis is going to be that there are certain things that reason must try to do because uh, they're. Um, trying to do that is a necessary condition of our using our understanding properly. Now, I haven't said what reason is yet, by the way. <laughs> this is all still pretty abstract. But there's some there's certain things that reason must try to do. Um, and so they're subjectively necessary. But the mistake is to think that um, that necessity applies to the object. So the object must be a certain way in order to enable us to, to reason to do those things. So, right, like that would be um, in the case of the um, 
accidental analytic, it was basically thinking just like that that led us to the transcendental deduction. There's certain things that understanding must be able to do. Therefore, the object must be such as to allow us to do it. So, but Kant is going to claim that although that was correct in the case of the transcendental analytic, in the case that is correct in the case of the understanding, in the case of reason, um, it's a mistake and it leads to an illusion. That here the subjective necessity really does correspond to an objective necessity, but here it doesn't. Um. Okay, other questions about this so far? I haven't got any questions for a long time. I'm sure it's not because I'm being so clear that no one has any questions. It must be on the contrary because I'm being so unclear that no one even knows what to ask. But anyway, I'll just keep going. Right. So, um, so like, what what is this reason? Um. So unfortunately, this is what Kant himself says about it. Um, this is on B355, Kemp Smith, page 300. Now that I have to give an explanation of this highest faculty of knowledge, I find myself in some difficulty. <laughs> that is, if we ask what is reason, Kant says, well, um, I find myself in some difficulty. <laughs> Um, okay, but of course he doesn't stop there. So like the difficulty, what is the difficulty? So basically the difficulty is the reason like the understanding has um, two different employments. So the first one is logical, that is formal logic, general logical. Um, and the second one is real or transcendental. Um, so these, these, I think, are, it's not just like the understanding, these also are the two employments that the understanding has, logical and real or transcendental. So in the case of understanding, the logical employment involves um, unifying uh, objects under concepts in judgments. And like, so maybe I should write understanding here for the time being because I'm about to talk about the two employments of the understanding. So the logical employment of the understanding. So remember how I tried to explain how that works. Um, Use the same picture for both. So a judgment, and again, as usual, I'm going to take the simplest case, which is a universal categorical, uh, positive categorical asymptotic judgment, right? Like all cinnabar is red. Um, so, um, um, The way a judgment works 
is um, that right. So this this is the judgment. Maybe I miss this because okay, so this is the judgment. All A is B. So the way it works is that B, the predicate concept, is a rule um, to which experience may or may not conform. And the judgment, I'm uh, applying the rule uh, not directly to experience, which that is not directly to what's manifold in sense, I guess is a better thing to say. I'm not applying it directly to what's manifold in sense. Uh, I'm applying it by way of a condition and the condition is um, established by some other concept somehow unifying that manifold into one thing to which I can then relate the predicate concept. Right, so like if I say all cinnabar is red, um, uh, I'm not applying the predicate red one by one to a whole bunch of causes of, of red sensations. Rather, I'm applying it to a lot of causes of red sensations all at once by using the concept cinnabar to collect them all together into one thing. Um, and then I can, so Kant sometimes says, I can think them, I can, I can think the objects of the predicate through the subject concept. Right, meaning like the rule is applied to these things not one by one, but all together insofar as the predicate concept unifies. And again, this is easiest to understand in the case of a universal, categorical, positive, assertoric judgment. I mean, here, like literally what's, what's going on is I'm taking a predicate like red, and I'm just applying it to all the things that fall under the subject concept together as one. Um, and that's the, um, well, okay, so you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Right, so and that's what I take it Kant means when he says, this is back on page 106, Contempt Smith, um, B94, describing what happens in a judgment. Instead of an immediate representation, a higher representation which comprises the immediate representation and various others is used in knowing the object and thereby much possible knowledge is collected into one. Right, so the much, much possible knowledge that's collected into one is, I mean, that, that sentence is not easy to interpret. And I think um, it's often interpreted to mean something like um, th this predicate, and there's reasons for this in the context. I'm not using the whole context, so I'm not giving this interpretation as fair uh, um, do or whatever, but, uh, the, the the way the tempting way of reading it is to say that the predicate concept, like let's say red, applies to cinnabar, but also to lots of other things. And so, like the many knowledge, the many knowledges that are being connected together into one are um, they're being they're being collected into one in the sense that the predicate concept can be used to make all these different judgments. Um, but the way I am, I'm understanding it, obviously, is that the many uh, knowledges that are being collected into one are like the knowledge, this is red, 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 so forth, 
right? They're all being collected into one in this judgment, but because instead of an immediate representation, so instead of B applying to an intuition, which is an immediate representation, it's applying to a higher representation that is the conscious cinnabar, and thereby uh, many knowledges are, are collected into one. So, um, so the logical function of the understanding or the logical functions of the understanding are all the ways of doing that, of using a higher representation to collect many knowledge into one, um, uh, using that uh, as the condition for applying some rule. Um, and that yields the table of judgments, right? Of universal, particular, singular, uh, you know, uh, affirmative, negative, uh, infinite, et cetera, right? Those are all like the different ways that you can do this. So like if this is, instead of all A is B, if this is some A is B, then, you know, I mean, we're still using A to avoid having to say, this is B, 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 right? Um, we're still collecting it together, but not for the purpose of applying B to all of it, but for the purpose of applying B to some of it, <laughs> right? Um, um, so, uh, and, you know, when you get to the more complicated uh, judgments, like hypothetical judgments and so far, so far, it gets much harder to draw this picture. <laughs> but, um, but still, I think, like, that's what the table of judgments is supposed to be. So that's the logical employment of the understanding then what's the real or transcendental employment of the understanding? Um, well, it's the one that's considered in transcendental logic. And it involves um, unifying the manifold under concepts in the first place. The logical function is to take um, the unification of the manifold and use it to combine many pieces of knowledge into one in a judgment. Whereas the real function of the understanding is to um, take the manifold given in sense and unify it under a judgment. Uh, sorry, under a concept. So you might say, well, those are almost the same thing, right? Those are just like two sides of the same coin. Um, and I um, and I think that's right. And I think that's the principle of the metaphysical deduction, right? So, uh, When Kant says, this is one of the most famous sentences in the book, but it's not necessarily easy to understand. It's uh, bottom of B104, top of B105 on page 112 of Kant's note. The same function which gives unity to the various representations in a judgment also gives unity to a mere synthesis of various representations in an intuition. And this unity in its most general expression we entitle the pure concept of understanding. Right, so the same function, like on the other way of, of understanding that first sentence, where like the function is, I guess you could say, the way the higher concept is related to the, the way the predicate is related to the subject. So, and the many pieces of knowledge that are collected into the one, or like all the subject concepts that could be related to it in that way. And then when you say it's the same function, you're saying something like, regarding the object of a concept of, as one is kind of like 
uh, um, regarding uh, this relationship as one of universal application. Like it's kind of analogous to it or something. And I think that that is the way a lot of people understand the metaphysical deduction. You, but you get into a lot of trouble that way because it's like, first of all, it's not clear how good the analogy is or what the analogy actually is. And second of all, it's not clear how you can draw any conclusions just from the fact that they've been analogous. Right, like, why does that mean? Why, why do all the things that the understanding does unify as the manifold of sensibility given in sense? Why do they all have to be analogous to things that it does to unify two concepts in a judgment? This just seem like different activities. And you're just like baldly asserting that they must have some analogy to each other. So um, despite some actual difficulty, I admit, I think my way of going is better because my way of going makes it clear why it's literally the same function. They must correspond to each other. All right, so those are the two uses of the understanding. Now, in the case of reason, um, So in the case of reason, the logical employment um, has to do not with judgments, but with what Kant called, um, well, I actually think Kant calls them uh, uh, reason conclusions, conclusions of reason. Um, but, uh, you know, that's just the German version of the term, the traditional term syllogism. I mean, it's not just, that's it's the standard German uh, equivalent of Syllogisms, the Latin word syllogisms, what we would say in English, syllogism. Um, but um, sleuths really do have to do with like enclosing or putting together, which is also what syllogism means. Uh, so, anyway, um, in brief. So anyway, so we're talking about syllogism. And you know, what is a syllogism? So like these are the like these are the fundamental types of inference in Aristotelian logic. I know have you guys seen this in some course? Did we teach this in some course? <laughs> like in film nine or anywhere? Well, maybe not. You know, like they go like this, like this is the simplest version. A is B, but B is C, therefore, I think it's good the other way. Therefore, A is C. Right, understanding that these are universal judgments. So all A is B, but all B is C, therefore all A is C. Um, And uh, I mean, I'll say more about how, how what these how these work and how Kant thinks they work in a second. But you know, so the difficulty Kant finds himself in is this is the way most people think of the faculty of reason. 
big business is to allow us to conclude um, one proposition from some one judgment from some others that are that are premises, right? So um, that's the logical employment. That's the way most people think of reason. But now he wants to say that it also has, or at least apparently has a transcendental employment. I mean, whether you want to say it has a transcendental employment or it just apparently has one depends exactly on how you think about it. Uh, but, uh, but in any case, so to do that needs to define reason abstractly enough, so to speak, that you can that you can see that the transcendental employment is an employment of the same faculty as the logical employment. So, or or to put it differently, I guess he has to be, he has to again find like the place where. Um, Transcendental employment at least seems to be just the other side of the coin of the logical employment. Um, okay, so what's so what's the logical employment? So um, um I guess just for terminology, right? This is called the major premise. This is called the minor premise. And this is called the conclusion. Um, this is this is how Aristotelians think about inference, that it's composed of units like this. Well, there also may be such a thing as called immediate inferences of understanding. He's not talked about that. I'm not going to go into that, but this is a basic way of thinking about inferences. So, um, uh, Kant understands this and therefore understands inference in general as not just being about, like, um, You have a list of sentences, and then you have some rule that says you're allowed to write down some other sentence. Rather, he thinks of it as um, um, explaining why this conclusion is. Um, so uh, and he has a general explanation of why you can use a form like this to explain why a judgment is true. Um, just like the law of contradiction was supposed to be a general explanation for the possibility of analytic judgments, the general explanation for the possibility of rational conclusions or syllogisms this is on the bottom of B360, it's on page 304 in Kemp Smith. In every syllogism, I first think a rule, the major premise for the understanding. Secondly, I subsume something known under the condition of the rule. Yes, I did write this down. Right. So, okay. So, I first think a rule. Now, like this rule itself is a rule applied on a condition that is, it's a judgment. Um, and that's the major premise. 
And then he goes, so secondly, I've seen something known under the something known, that is, I have seen some object of knowledge under the condition of the rule. So the condition of the rule in this case of a categorical judgment is just the subject concept. Right? That's the condition on which the rule, the rule, properly speaking, is the predicate concept. But it's being applied on the condition of, of the subject concept. And then some object of knowledge, something known, is subsumed under the condition of the rule in the minor terms. Finally, what is thereby known, I determined through the predicate of the rule, and so a priori to reason the conclusion. Right? So now I know that C falls under B, but I don't just know that. I know why it falls under B. It falls under B because it can be subsumed under the condition on which B applies. So B applies on this condition A, but I've subsumed C under A. And so I know that C, because it's A, must be B. Right, so like if you say, you know, um, still showing up in the notes. If you say like all compounds of mercury are toxic, but cinnabar is a compound of mercury. Therefore, all cinnabar is toxic. So now I'm not just saying, um, just like asserting on the basis of what? On the basis of like experience, it would have to be. I'm not just asserting directly on the basis of, of experience that cinnabar is a condition under, under which you can apply this rule of toxic. I'm saying why cinnabar is a condition under which you can apply this rule of toxic. Because we already know you can apply this rule of toxic on the condition that something is a compound of mercury. But cinnabar, all cinnabar, is a compound of mercury. And so cinnabar in general, has, since it falls under the condition of the rule, the rule must apply. And so when he says it can be known a priori through reason, he means like obviously this doesn't mean it can be known absolutely a priori, right? I mean, because this principle itself is empirical. So it doesn't give us the right to assert this like the way we could assert that two plus three equals five or you know, every event has a cause or whatever. But it means uh it's a priori in the sense that it's before any experience of whether cinnabar is toxic. Before any direct experience of that. All I have to know is that it's a compound of mercury, and then I can use this principle to explain, um, to require and explain why it's toxic. Um, um, So, um, because of this general explanation, Kant says that um, there are a lot of different ways of classifying syllogisms, forms and figures and all kinds of stuff. Kant says this is the only classification that's important. Classify them by the relation of judgment in the major premise. Why? Because the relation of the judgment is about how, like, what kind of condition we're using to apply the rule. If it's a categorical judgment, um, we're applying the rule based on uh, a condition that's internal to the object that we're judging about. Right? So, like, it's, it's 
clear in this case that it may it's because of something um, intrinsic to cinnabar um, that I mean not internal to the concept of cinnabar. Let's assume because it weren't internal to the concept of cinnabar, then this would be analytic. We wouldn't really need this syllogism to explain. Right? But it's internal to cinema. So the object of the context of that. Um, so, um, so, so this is a way of explaining that a judgment is true based on um, something about the subject of the judgment. Whereas, like, if we have a hypothetical judgment, so, like, This is a hypothetical syllogism, right? So here, the condition, and it's easy for me to give examples like this. It's harder for me to give examples like this. I'm not sure exactly what kind of example Kant is thinking of. I mean, it's easy to understand if these two, if the subject of both judgments are the same. Well, no, not just that. I mean, it's easy to understand if it meant something like, Right, like all cinnabar, if it has such and such crystal structure, is shiny or something like that. And then you can say, but this cinnabar has that crystal structure, therefore it is shiny. But um, but we should be able to do it, you know, like this because this is a general form of a hypothetical judgment, and I don't know how to give a good example of it, but. Whatever a good example would be like, the point is that this condition here is um, something that's external to the subject of the conclusion. So, right, it's some uh, condition that holds of something else, such that uh, if this condition holds, then this judgment has to be true. And then we... And then we subsume, so what are we subsuming under this condition? Like what's analogous to subsuming under the condition here is just saying that the condition holds. Also a little bit hard to understand. But then we get the conclusion that because that external conclusion, that external condition holds, that's why the C is D. C is D because we know in general that C has to be D if A is D. But A is the condition A is D holds, and therefore that explains why C is D. So it's a different kind of explanation because of the different relation of the condition to the rule in the major premise. Um, and so I'm not going to write out a disjunctive syllogism because right now it's just even more complicated. But um, but uh, so that's Kant's general idea about how to classify syllogisms. But that since this, a syllogism works by um, starting with a rule on a condition, which is the major premise, and then using that to reach the conclusion, um, like the different ways of doing that are equal to 
the different ways of applying a rule on a condition. Yeah. There's a couple things. Yes. So first, a rule. A rule. Well, the rule of judgment. Well, what? A rule is really a, a concept, right? That's what right. you know. So that, like, the, uh, uh, it's specifically for us. It means a rule to which the manifold in sense may conform or can, you know may agree. Um, but. Uh, um, so if it's like a standard letter, it's a, it's a, well, it's, it's, well, it's not, I mean, it's, so at least in a categorical judgment, the rule is not a judgment at all. It's just a concept, right? So like if I say all cinnabar is red, um, then um, the rule is being red. <laughs> right, which is like a certain rule. I mean, it's it's not such a simple rule, actually, right? Like if something is red, um, it has to cause red sensations in someone who's appropriately situated in the in normal lighting conditions and whatever. But it has to cause other kinds of sensations under other conditions, right? Like, uh, yeah, so anyway, but it's, yeah, it's some kind of rule like that. Now, I mean, in the case of hypothetical and disjunctive judgments, the rule, in the case of a hypothetical judgment, the rule itself is already a judgment. Um, or at least uh, it can be, right? So like in that simple form I wrote up, like, The rule is still just this concept. Um, but in general, you can't write it that way. So it's, you know, but I mean, a judgment is a concept immediately applied. It's like immediate concept. So, I mean, it's a rule um, that I'm taking to apply on a condition. If I assert that, it asks a torque judgment that uh, I'm actually applying the rule, so to speak, right? But here, as Beth said way back when, the, the judgments that make up a hypothetical judgment are themselves problematic, not oscillatory, right? So I'm only in entertaining the possibility of applying this concept on this condition. Um, so this is still like just a rule to which the manifold given in sense may or may not apply. It's just more complicated. I, I don't know if that explanation helps or not. It helps a little bit. <laughs> Did you have another question? Uh, I said rules of subsume. Subsume, yeah. So subsume, like subsume a case under a rule is just to say that it's a case of that rule. Right, so it's, you know, like, um, like in a case of literal rules, or like the, the, the word that Kant uses for rule, gesetz, can also be translated as law, right? It's like, so, I mean, think of a literal law in the law court, you know, so like, the first thing you have to do is determine whether the actions, the facts that we're talking about are instances of a certain law or not. That's subsumption, right? Like, was this theft? Was this, you know, whatever. And then based on that, we reach a judgment of a guilty or innocent, right? So that, that first step is subsumption. So here we're, you know, I mean, These are both, in the case of the categorical judgment, these are these look very similar to each other. But they just and, and, and they are, right? I mean, these are both themselves, these are both categorical judgments, but their function is different. This one is like gonna be the principle we're using for explaining things. 
this one is going to be the way we bring things into that principle and let it be used on them. That's the subsumption. You can see in the case of uh, uh, hypothetical syllogism that, you know, like here they're quite different. This one still, you know, but is that why? Again, I don't understand exactly what subsumption comes to here. As usual, the first case is easy, and that's the one Todd discusses in detail. And the other cases are hard, and he doesn't discuss them in detail. Um, he doesn't explain in what sense this is subsumption. I guess what we want to say is, you know, you have to think of the thing to be known here as, yeah, maybe. The way to understand this lies is in a direction kind of like this. You have to think of the thing to be known here not as C, but as a kind of like state of affairs in which C is D. <laughs> right? And so like we're kind of here we're kind of subsuming the well not a state of no, not the state of affairs in which C is D. Kind of the state of affairs we're trying to know here. I, and we're we're subsuming that under the condition A is B. That we're, that is we're saying the current state of affairs or the one that we're trying to know is one where A is B. Right? Just like here we're we're saying like the thing we want to know cinema is you know um, one of the ones that the, the that falls under this condition comes out of Marx. And like I said, this jump to syllogism is even harder to understand, but like I think you can make sense of this, but I but it's not easy. <laughs> um all right. Other questions? <laughs> Those are both good questions. No. All right. Um okay. Professor? Yes. Um, I don't have a question about the material right now. Yes. Um, but we're close to the end of class. So I did want to ask um, if you have any insight into um, what might be happening um, if the strike starts on Monday because of my other classes. We've been talking about it and how some classes aren't even occurring anymore to support the TAs if, uh, if, it, if it happens. Oh, OK. I thought I would discuss that on Thursday, but um... Okay, I can wait. Yeah. I can wait. Just uh, since I was yeah. here, I wanted to ask. <laughs> but I think if it happens, so like first of all, attendance is is never required, and it's so right. Required attending. So, um, so if there is a strike, you know, even more so, like there's you know no requirement that anyone come. I think if there is a strike and it continues into Tuesday, I so. If there's if it looks like there's any chance that the entrance to campus is blocked, there's no way I'm driving here from Berkeley. <laughs> right. So um, so if anything like that is going on, uh, I think I will still give a lecture, which you can attend or not, as you you know see fit. But I will record it and I'll do it over Zoom. Um, if there's a strike and the entrance is not blocked. I don't know. I have to think about that. But usually, if there's a strike, the entrance is blocked. <laughs> okay. The other part of that or question, you can't I... tell, right? Like I have to know, you know, I have to know at the time I leave that it will be. I'll be able to get in when I get there. So, yeah. Is the, that the, does that answer your question? Uh, mostly the other the other small part of that question because in uh, Professor Singh's class last night, uh, she mentioned that her um, TA had. Uh, and I guess the TAs in general had asked the professors not to do any grading if um, the uh, uh, um, strike goes through. And that made me curious about, you know, like our paper that's due on Monday and stuff like right. that going forward. Well, not only that, but the paper that was already handed in that I haven't gotten back yet. Exactly. Yeah. Is, like, I don't have a TA in this class and so no one has asked me to do anything. <laughs> uh, All right. So, uh, and, you know, like, I don't feel like I'm, since I have no TA in this class, I don't feel like I'm 
you know, like scabbing for a TA if I keep creating the papers. So, uh, I, you know, I think I will keep creating the papers, whatever happens. Okay. Um, although, you know, I certainly, I, re I certainly respect and understand why some faculty members think that they should in effect, like join the strike and not do anything. Uh, I don't, um, Well, and that's why I was curious because from what I've been hearing, responsibilities here. Like, yeah, so, from what I I've mean, been. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm going to keep trying to do, basically, I keep trying to do my job as well as I can, but, uh, but certainly, like, make it possible for the students to respect the strike however they want. Is that so? I will keep grading as the answer to that. Okay. No, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that because from what I've been getting, it seems like it could be different with every single class. Yes, I think it could be because there's no um like the legal situation is unclear and i guess i think the moral situation is unclear so every professor is doing different things <laughs> thank um, you hopefully this strike won't be incredibly long like the one we had a few years ago uh um i mean usually when the union calls a strike it's for a limited period of time so hopefully that's what's going to happen here but i don't know we'll we'll have to see <laughs> Um, all right. I am almost out of time. Uh, I don't want to like not get to the transcendental function of reason here because it's obviously the punchline. So, I mean, I just, I get, I try to stay very quickly. So, um, so to get from this logical employment to the transcendental employment, uh, um, uh, tries to explain in what sense of syllogism is also a kind of unification of something. Um, now, like the unification of what? So, um, again, like, it is kind of similar to the judgment case. We have this major premise, which could be the major premise of many different syllogisms. And we could look at the major premise of unifying all those syllogisms because they all have the same principle. Right? So, like, you could fill in lots of different compounds of mercury here and reach a different conclusion from each one, all using the same premise. That's similar to seeing the unity that the understanding supplies here as a unity of like different judgments that all have B as their premise. Um, but again, I think the right way to understand it is um, that what's unified. Um, ultimately is um, the object that the syllogism is about. So what object is the syllogism about? Well, I mean, like, so, so Kant says the syllogism is like immediate, is immediate that it has a middle term, and this is called a middle term. I mean, that's the traditional terminology, right? And the middle term is repeat, repeated twice. So, like in the conclusion, the middle term is gone, but the middle term was what allowed us to connect the subject to the predicate in the conclusion. So Kant says this, you know, the syllogism basically is the judgment that C is B, only mediated by the concept A as the explanation for why C is B. So the, the syllogism is really about C. In this case, it's about cinema. So what we're unifying, as I would understand it, is exactly the same manifold and sense that are that are unified in the judgment. Um, all cinnabar is toxic. Namely, all the sensations of cinema. But as Kant says, it's 
the unity of reason is a completely different unity from the unity of the understanding. And what's the unity? So the unity is the unity of explanation. So actually, make make me snap and I'll call this C one. Right? And C is the concept of cinnabar. <laughs> B is the concept of oxygen. And now what we're doing is um, in the judgment, all we were doing is bringing these all together in order to apply the concept of But in the syllogism, we're bringing them all together in order to give the explanation A for why B applies to C. So we're unifying them as different like cases of cinnabar being toxic under a common explanation. And so you realize like this conclusion could be true even if there was no common explanation. It could be that all cinnabar is toxic, but some of it is toxic for this reason, and some of it is toxic for a different reason. Um, so the, the judgment doesn't supply that unity of explanation, it doesn't assert it, right? It's only the syllogism. So this is the unity of reason. The unity of reason is to um, unify the application of a concept to the manifold under a common explanation. It depends on the unity of the understanding, right? Like first you have to have all this collected together as cinnabar or else you couldn't explain anything about it. But it's uh, a different and like higher level unity. So what is or would be the real or transcendental employment of reason? And it would be to um, um, so the real or, or transcendental employment of the understanding was to uh, explain all the ways in which it must be possible to unify this manifold of sense so that the unity of the understanding for the purpose of the judgment can be applied to. So the, the transcendental or real employment of reason would be to explain what must be true of this manifold of sense in order to make it possible for this unity of explanation to apply. So we're going to say something about, so we're, we're, we're going to try to say that somehow the object of the syllogism, that is the object of the subject concept of the conclusion, must be a certain way, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to explain it in the ways we, we need to, the three different ways we need to. Um, but then it's that demand that Kant is going to say is illegitimate, right? That is, he's going to say that this is a subjective need of ours to find unifying explanations, but we don't have a right to demand it of the object. Um, and the way that mistake is going to lead to these transcendental ideas is that we're going to say, well, like what would guarantee that we can always find explanations like this in the empirical cases? And the answer must be um, that, um, for example, there's some absolutely internal condition that every object of experience has in common. Um, that um, such that uh, there's always a way to use that to arrive at a unified explanation of things via uh, categorical syllogisms. And so, and so forth for the other two relations. Uh, I know that what I just said now is probably didn't make sense. Uh, I'll try to say it more clearly next time, but we're out of time. So I'll see you then. Oh, yeah.